Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today's video is a slightly different style for the channel. What I've done is I've taken a video from my Neuroanatomy Question Bank course and I'm uploading it here on YouTube. So you can see the style of video that we use in that course. And you can see whether or not you like this learning style. Now a couple of things before we get into the video itself. In the first line of the description will be a link to a slideshow that has the 10 questions that we're going to be answering today. I'd encourage you to go through those 10 questions first before going through the answers here in the video. The second link in the description will take you to these images here. You won't need to have a pack system downloaded on your mobile or your desktop. You'll be able to scroll through these freely. You'll be able to zoom in and zoom out to these images, change the windowing of these, and really spend time looking at the different anatomical structures that we're going to be discussing in the questions that follow. I've also linked this 3D rendering here that I've annotated. You'll be able to scroll around this 3D rendering and really look at the different structures and see what their labels are. Now in the Neuroanatomy course itself, we've got 14 different image sets just like these that you'll be able to have access to. We've got CTs, MRIs, and X-rays, all focused on head and neck anatomy. And it's my hope that by having access to these images, you'll get comfortable scrolling through the different types of scans. You can really play about with these pack systems. Now below this video as well, I've timestamped the various different answers. If you were just unsure about one or two answers, you can jump to those answers. You don't have to watch the whole video in its entirety. The same thing happens in the Neuroanatomy course. So enjoy this talk, go ahead and answer the questions first and I'll see you at the other side. Okay, so welcome. Let's go through the first 10 questions in this anatomy question bank. First up, we're asked to name this arrowed opening. You can see we've got an axial bone windowed CT scan here and this is the opening we're asked to label. Now there's actually only three openings at the posterior aspect of the orbit. We've got the superior orbital fissure, the optic canal, and the inferior orbital fissure. And what we're dealing with here is the left superior orbital fissure. Now I'm going to harp on about this throughout this course. When you can lateralize anatomy, be sure to do so. If you can say whether something's on the left or the right hand side of the patient, include it in your answer. Most anatomy exams are going to mark you down if you leave that out. I'm probably going to leave it out at some stage during this course. You might find yourself also forgetting to lateralize the anatomy. This is just a reminder. Include which side of the patient we're talking about. Now, how do I know this is the superior orbital fissure as opposed to the other openings? Well, firstly, the clue here is this bone here. This is what's known as the anterior clinoid process. The anterior clinoid process is part of the lesser wings of the sphenoid. If we have a look at the CT scan itself here, here's the anterior clinoid process. Notice on our coronal planes here that the anterior clinoid processes are superior structures. They lie on the superior aspect of this posterior orbit here. Underneath the anterior clinoid processes and subsequently the lesser wings of the sphenoid, we can see this opening running underneath it here. You see running through here if you follow my mouse cursor. That's the optic canal. It's medial to those anterior clinoid processes. You can see it on the axial slice here. Here's the optic canal medial to the anterior clinoid process. Lateral to that, again, if we look on our coronal slices here, lateral to that is this, the superior orbital fissure, medial the optic canal. The optic canal has the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery running through it. Inferior to that, we can see the inferior orbital fissure here, if you follow my cursor. You can see the inferior orbital fissure is much below those anterior clinoid processes. So that's our clue as to where we are within the orbit. We're superior here. These anterior clinoid processes, they kind of face posteriorly towards the posterior clinoid processes. And there's this dural wall that makes up the lateral walls of the pituitary fossa here. Okay, so that's the answer to question one, the left superior orbital fissure. In question two, we asked which structures pass through this opening. Now, if you're going to rote learn anything in neuroanatomy, I'd highly encourage you to go through any fissure, any canal, any foramen that exits the cranial vault and think about what passes through that and learn which structures pass through those openings. These are common questions that will come up in every neuroanatomy exam, especially the cranial nerves. Knowing how the cranial nerves pass from the central nervous system out to the periphery is a very high yield thing to do. And this is one such question. So again, I'm going to show you that coronal plane that we just looked at and highlight the superior orbital fissure, which lies laterally to the optic canal here. Now we asked what passes through it. If you want to ask, answer this question basically, you can talk about the cranial nerves, cranial nerves three, four, five, and six that pass through here. And you can talk about the veins that pass from the orbit back into the cranium, the ophthalmic veins. The ophthalmic artery is coming from the optic canal here, traveling with the optic nerve. It doesn't pass through the superior orbital fissure. 
We can zoom in on that, and some of those cranial nerves actually divide into smaller branches prior to passing through the superior orbital fissure. And if you take a cranial nerve like cranial nerve 5, we know the trigeminal nerve, it extends through multiple different foramina out of the cranial vault, and only a certain division of that is going to pass through the superior orbital fissure. So let's go through those structures. In blue, I've labeled the veins, the ophthalmic veins. We've got a superior ophthalmic vein and an inferior ophthalmic vein. We've also got a second inferior ophthalmic vein that's exiting out of the inferior orbital fissure. Again, the ophthalmic artery is coming from the optic canal here with the optic nerve. Then the ocular motor nerve is actually divided into a superior and inferior division prior to exiting through the superior orbital fissure. And you can just see we label it here, S and I, superior and inferior, the cranial nerve 3, the ocular motor nerve. The trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 4, passes through the superior orbital fissure. And then we've got cranial nerve 5. Now, cranial nerve 5 is a useful nerve to really know the ins and outs of it, where it originates and how it passes out the skull. We know cranial nerve 5 is the trigeminal nerve. It's got three main branches, an ophthalmic division, maxillary division, and a mandibular division. And that ophthalmic and maxillary division are both sensory divisions. That mandibular division has motor supply as well. What's also similar about the ophthalmic division and the maxillary division is that they both pass through the cavernous sinus. The mandibular division doesn't. It goes down through the foramen of all. Now, it's the ophthalmic division that goes through the cavernous sinus and extends through the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary division doesn't go through the superior orbital fissure. It goes through the foramen rotundum. Now, there are three separate branches of that ophthalmic division that head through the superior orbital fissure, and you can learn these names if you want to, depending on how much detail you want to answer this in an exam. We've got the lacrimal nerve, the frontal nerve, and the nasociliary nerve. Again, all sensory nerves here. You can see we've labeled cranial nerve 5, the Roman numeral for 5, and A meaning the first division, the ophthalmic division. And the last cranial nerve that passes through here is the abducens nerve, cranial nerve 6. This is a great piece of anatomy to learn a common question that comes up in exams. So let's go to question number 3. We're asked to name the arrowed structure. You can see here we've got a frontal radiograph. This is a scout image of the CT scan that we've just looked at. And it's this structure that we asked to label. This, again, let's lateralize, is the left frontal sinus. Frontal sinus is one of four paranasal sinuses. We've got the frontal, maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoid sinuses. And you can see the asymmetry here in the frontal sinus. See how it's smaller on the left and bigger on the right? If we go back to our scan and scroll up into those frontal sinuses, this asymmetry is common. In fact, it's the norm. You can see the frontal crest on the internal aspect of the frontal bone here with this bony septum separating the left and right hand side. And we can get multiple bony septa as well, that's normal. We may even get hyperplastic or aplastic frontal sinuses, that's common. And if you see a suture running down the midline here, that's what's known as a persistent metopic suture that can also come up commonly in exams. So that's the left frontal sinus. In question four, we asked within which cranial bone is this structure located? When it comes to paranasal sinuses, this is an easy question. They're named after the bone that they lie within. The frontal sinus lies within the frontal bone. Maxillary sinus lies within the maxilla. Ethmoid sinus in the ethmoid bone. Sphenoid sinus in the sphenoid bone. A useful thing to remember when you're talking about paranasal sinuses is where do they drain to? They're mucus lined, mucus can fill up, fluid can fill up within these sinuses, and they need to drain, and they all drain into the nasal cavity. Now, different sinuses drain into different regions within the nasal cavity, and we're going to cover this multiple times in this neuroanatomy course. The frontal sinus and the maxillary sinus, as well as the anterior ethmoid air cells, all drain into the middle nasal meatus. The sphenoid sinus and the posterior ethmoidal air cells drain into the superior nasal meatus. And actually later in this talk, we're going to look at the nasal meatus. We're actually going to look at the inferior nasal meatus. So let's touch on that when we get to the last question. Question five, we're asked to name this space. Now, this is also a common question that comes up because people can get confused as to where we are. Often people can look at this and think we're intracranial. We're within the cranial vault. This is actually an extracranial space. Here is the posterior cranial fossa where our occipital lobe and our cerebellum is going to lie. We can see the carotid canal here. These are the greater wings of the sphenoid. We've got the frame and oval here. We can see the head of the mandible. This actually lies underneath the middle cranial fossa. And it's what's known as the infratemporal fossa. Infra being under the temporal fossa. It lies underneath the temporal lobe. And again, we're on the left-hand side here. 
Let's have a look at our scan and get our orientation here. I'm going to scroll down to where we asked the label. Notice here on our coronal plane how the temporal lobe is going to sit in this middle cranial fossa. If I scroll out to the side in our sagittal plane, you can see the anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa here. Notice how this space here, let me go actually to the side that we are asked to label. Let's scroll all the way across to the left-hand side here. There, and let's get up there. You can see that this fossa here lies underneath the middle cranial fossa, underneath the temporal lobe. It's the infratemporal fossa. It's outside of the cranial vault. Now, the infratemporal fossa also lies underneath the temporal fossa, where the temporal muscle runs on the side of the head here. If I scroll up superiorly, here's the temporal fossa we can see here. Below the temporal fossa, we get into the infratemporal fossa, a really important space, especially when we're looking at head and neck spaces. Okay, so that's the left infratemporal fossa. Question six, which opening marks the boundary between this space and the pterygopalatine fossa? When we talk about the pterygopalatine fossa, we're talking about this space here. Anteriorly, it's made, the border is the posterior aspect of the maxilla, or the maxillary sinus. Medially, we've got the palatine bone, and posteriorly, we've got the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, making up defined borders here. Laterally, there isn't a defined border. It's just an opening into the infratemporal fossa. This opening is what's known as a pterygomaxillary fissure, and it's the left pterygomaxillary fissure in this question here. This is where the maxillary artery is going to enter the pterygopalatine fossa. Remember that fossa is mainly made up of fat. It's a good review area if we're looking for masses within this region. So the answer here, the left pterygomaxillary fissure. Question seven, we're asked to name the arrowed structure here. Okay, so we're dealing with the frontal bone. The frontal bone has a vertical portion and a horizontal portion. The horizontal portion making up most of the anterior cranial floor. The vertical portion is where those frontal sinuses are um, embedded. Here we've got the glabella and the midline. We've got superciliary arches. And then we've got this process extending out towards the zygoma. And this process is what's called the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. And this is on the left-hand side. So this is the left zygomatic process of the frontal bone. I've included this because people can often get confused about the zygoma. The zygoma has three separate processes. A frontal process a temporal process and a maxilla process here or maxillary process. This is not the greater wing of the sphenoid. The bone making up the posterior aspect of the orbit here is the greater wing of the sphenoid, making up the inferior border of this superior orbital fissure. But this lateral and slightly anterior part of the orbit is all part of the zygoma here. This is not extending towards the sphenoid bone. Remember, this is the zygoma, the zygomatic bone on the left-hand side. Question seven, name the arrowed suture. So we've got a suture between the frontal bone and the zygoma. This is what's known as the left frontozygomatic suture. And you can see as we go throughout this course, the way in which we name sutures is fairly unique. Behind this, there's a suture here between the greater wing of the sphenoid and the frontal bone, and that's the sphenofrontal suture, not the frontosphenal suture. And we're going to cover those as we go on throughout this course. The simple answer here, the left frontozygomatic suture. Our last two questions for this section, we're asked to name the arrowed structure here. We're within the nasal cavity, and if you look closely, we've got a bone running within this soft tissue here. Now this bone is actually its own unique cranial bone. When we think about the frontal bone, or the sphenoid bone, or the ethmoid bone, or the occipital bone, they're individual bones. This itself is also its own individual bone that people often forget about, and it's what's known as the inferior nasal concha. Concha or conch meaning shell-shaped, how it curves round in on itself. If you blow a conch, if you've seen in movies, when they make that trumpet sound into a shell that's bending over like that. And this is on the left-hand side, so we've got the left inferior nasal concha. It makes up the internal surface of that inferior nasal turbinate. If I go to our scan here and go to the coronal plane and scan anteriorly, here we can see our middle nasal concha and the inferior nasal concha. Now the bone within the middle nasal concha and the superior nasal concha, those are part of the ethmoid bone itself. They're not their own unique bones. The inferior nasal concha is its own unique cranial bone here, or viscerocranial bone here. You can see how it forms that inferior nasal turbinate.
The answer here, left inferior nasal conca. Let's go to question 10. We asked to name the nasal space lateral to this structure. So this is asking about this space here. You can see this dark space here. If we go back to our scan, again, we're at the coronal plane. Let's go on our uh, sagittal slice and go right to exactly where we're looking. So here, the inferior nasal concha. On our axial plane, we can see the inferior nasal concha here. It's this space here on the coronal that we asked to the name. Now, when we're looking at the nasal cavity or nasal spaces, we get turbinates, which are the bone and soft tissue, and then we get meati, which are the spaces. So this is the inferior nasal meatus. We get a middle nasal meatus and a superior nasal meatus, each having different things drain into it. Remember, in the previous questions, I was saying the superior nasal meatus receives uh, fluid from the sphenoid sinus as well as the posterior ethmoid air cells. Middle nasal meatus gets from maxilla and from frontal sinuses and the anterior ethmoidal air cells. The inferior nasal meatus, which is the answer to this question here, our left inferior nasal meatus, it doesn't receive fluid from any of the paranasal sinuses. It receives fluid from the nasolacrimal duct. I'll show you how to identify the nasolacrimal duct. If you go to the orbit, look medially where the lacrimal bone is and where this frontal projection of the maxilla is. We get this circle forming here. This is the nasolacrimal canal in which the nasolacrimal duct runs. It connects the lacrimal sac on the medial aspect of the eye down towards the inferior nasal meatus. You can also see it on the coronal plane as we scan anteriorly. Here's the lacrimal sac, here's the nasolacrimal duct, and it goes into the inferior nasal meatus. You can go across on our sagittal plane and see that beautifully illustrated there. This is the nasolacrimal duct going into the inferior nasal meatus. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed that style of learning. If you do, be sure to go check out the Neuroanatomy Question Bank that I will have linked below. Otherwise, subscribe to this YouTube channel. I'm constantly uploading videos related to radiology physics and radiology anatomy. Until the next video, goodbye everybody.